time is now 6.02 p.m. This board will go into um, our meeting for the Goose Creek CISD Board of Trustees. Before we get started, I'd like to read a, a short script for TAS, from TASB regarding um, the Open Meetings Act and video conferencing. Um, on March 16th, Governor Greg Abbott granted a request by T Attorney General Cam Paxton to temporarily suspend a limited number of open meetings laws to extent necessary to allow telephonic or video conference meetings in response to co coronavirus COVID-19. For information about the suspension, see TASB Legal Services article, Texas Governor suspends certain provisions for open meeting acts due to coronavirus COVID-19. And according to what those suspended rules, we certify the following. Notice this meeting has been posted online for at least 72 hours, one hour if it's an emergency meeting or emergency supplemental item. Although members of the board are not gathered in a central physical location, we do have a quorum in attendance at this meeting by video conferencing or telephone call, but we, we do have a quorum here as well. We are meeting by use of Cisco WebEx software application which allows two-way communication for members of the public. As we would in any meet person meeting, members of the public who have followed the instructions on the meeting notice for registering to speak during the public comment portion will be unmuted for three minutes to speak. If the speaker submitted written comments in the past, the board secretary will read the comments into the record before or during the board's consideration of that item. If you would like to provide a comment for future meeting conducted by video conference or telephone call, please follow the instructions on the meeting notice. All other meeting procedures will adhere to the board adopted procedures to the extent cap practicable and audio recording of this meeting is being made and, and be available to the public at a later date. The software application allows for 1,000 members of people to view and interact at a time. We apologize in advance for any unforeseeable difficulties and ask you to be patient as we navigate unprecedented conditions. If any question is suspended loss, please call the Office of Attorney General at 888-672-6787 or by email at capital T, capital O, capital M, capital A at oag.texas.gov. Okay, um, Mr. Poppy, was the meeting properly posted? It was. And do we have a quorum? We do, yes. Excellent, thank you. Um, Dr. Ryan. Oh, um, Dr. Brian. This evening we have a presentation for our seniors entering the military who may not be here for our walk cer uh, celebration in July. Okay, I'll uh, let me get my screen shared here real quick. There we okay, go. Okay, hopefully you can see that uh, introductory slide. Is that is that showing the recognition for seniors? Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. All right, so we'll begin our presentation. Um, good evening, Dr. O'Brien and Goose Creek CISD Board of Trustees. This evening, we would like to recognize our seniors who have made the vital decision to serve our country by choosing to enter a branch of the military. Less than 1% of all high school graduates, roughly 150,000 seniors nationwide, choose to serve their country in this manner. Through their service, these seniors will gain four or more years of meaningful work-related experience and will learn how to effectively work in teams, preparing them for their future careers. The students that are being honored tonight reported their intent with their senior counselor, their college and career counselor, or their junior ROTC instructor. I would like to take this time to recognize and thank our junior reserve officer training corps staff in Goose Creek CISD for building a solid foundation and preparing students for a possible career in military service. Our junior ROTC instructors at Goose Creek Memorial are Master Sergeant Top Anderson and Gunnery Sergeant Anthony McKenzie. Instructors at Lee High School are Lieutenant Colonel Jeff Wooldridge and Gunnery Sergeant Jason Wells. Instructors at Sterling High School are Colonel Patrick Farrell and Sergeant Major MJ Hinges. Students who spend two credit years in the MC Junior ROTC can join the military at a higher rank. So there is an advantage to being in the Junior ROTC. And I would also Bollinger, like to recognize, yes. I, I believe we have slides to accompany your opening statements. Yes, can you see my slides? Yeah, it's, it's on the very first slide. Okay, I'll, I'll uh, scroll through those. Um, I would also like to recognize our director of CTE who oversees our junior ROTC program, Renee Dillon. So here's our instructors and our, our team here for uh, 
GCM. Yeah, be quiet. Here's our, here's our Lee High School Junior ROTC instructors. And then here's our Sterling Junior ROTC instructors. So at this time, each school will recognize their seniors who are military bound. We will begin with Top Anderson, lead Junior ROTC instructor at GCM. Next, we'll hear from Joe Farnsworth, principal at Lee High School. And then last, from Nathan Chaddock, principal at Sterling High School. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over uh, to Top Anderson. Uh, good evening. At this time, I'd like to recognize the uh, following seniors from uh, Goose Creek Memorial who have chosen to enter a branch of the Armed Services. First is Alyssa Carbajal, as enlisted in the United States Army. Alyssa was in JROTC for two years and achieved the rank of Cadet Corporal. Next is Tori Hillstock, as enlisted in the United States Army Reserve. Tori chose to serve in the military because she is from a military background and felt like it was right. Next, we have Abraham Casas, as enlisted in the United States Marine Corps. We are proud of you, Abraham. And just as a note, uh, his sister is also on active duty in the Air Force. Elion Richarte has enlisted in the United States Marine Corps. Elion was in the JROTC for four years with the, with the rank of Cadet Staff Sergeant. Elion states, I enlisted because I wanted to do something that would give me a sense of pride, something that would let me do something bigger than myself. Serving in the military will always allow me to develop a positive character to be better than who I am. Next, we have Marcus Botello, as enlisted in the United States Navy. Marcus is excited about his new chapter in life. Next is Trenton Brown, as enlisted in the United States Navy. Trenton is looking forward to opportunities and adventures. Next, we have Christian Cockle, as enlisted in the United States Navy. Christian so chose to serve in the military because he wanted to take charge of his future and take care of his family. We have Nico Mark Lagrada as enlisted in the United States Navy. Nico says, I joined the Navy to proudly serve and honor our country. It gives me the opportunity to travel while also gaining experience and it has great benefits for my future education. Logan Lopez has enlisted in the United States Navy. Logan has been a Boy Scout for 12 years, a Ski Sea Scout for five years. He has earned the rank of Eagle Scout and Quartermaster. Logan says, I have always respected those who serve our country and wanted to do the same. I joined the Navy to fulfill that wish and to gain experience in fields of law enforcement and other future careers. I am excited to learn new skills, serve my country, and see the world. Once again, congratulations to these wonderful students. Joe Farnsworth will now present students from Lee High School who are entering the military. Good evening, everyone. Um, first, I'd like to thank Dr. O'Brien, our governing board members, uh, Mrs. Renee Dillon, our CTE director that's over our JROTC program, and our two teachers at Lee High School, Colonel Woolridge and Gunnery Sergeant Wells. Uh, they've done a fantastic job. Our first senior that we'd like to recognize tonight is Aubrey Griffin. He intends to enlist in the United States Air Force. Aubrey was in JROTC for four years with the rank of Cadet Gunnery Sergeant. Next is Kyler Samuels. He's enlisted in the United States Army and we are so proud of Kyler, he's done a great job. Next is Lexis Harrington. She's enlisted in the United States Coast Guard. Lexis states, joining the military was a decision of how I wanted to prepare for the future. I would have become a statistic as a dropout or transferred to another school, joining the military was a way to jumpstart my future. Next is Ezekiel Sugram. He's enlisted in the United States Marine Corps. Ezekiel was in JRO, JROTC for four years with the rank of Cadet Gunnery Sergeant. Ezekiel states, I'm joining the Marines because of Sergeant Major Helms. Before I met him, I didn't think about joining However, as I spent more time in the Robert E. Lee JROTC program, I started to look up to Sergeant Major Helms because of his passion and love for the program and fellow cadets. Next is Luz Mede Contreras. She's enlisted in the United States Navy. Luz Mede shared, I decided to enlist for the adventure 
and to do something extraordinary and new. Ruby Herrera has enlisted in the United States Navy. Ruby states, I enlisted because it's very important for me to be involved and informed about what's going on in our nation. And last but not least is Brendan Ross. He has enlisted in the United States Navy. Brendan was in JROTC for four years with the rank of Cadet Staff Sergeant. Brendan states, I decided to join the Navy because I've, I've wanted to join since I was a kid and the Navy is full of opportunity. We are so proud of these young uh, cadets and uh, we wish them the very best in their future. At this time, I turn it all over to Nathan Chaddock, principal of Ross S. Sterling High School. Thank you, Dr. Farnsworth. Um, good evening. At this time, I too would like to recognize our, our seniors from Sterling High School who have chosen to enter a branch of the armed services. I would first like to start by thanking our, our fine instructors, Colonel Farrell and Sergeant Major Hinges. They do just a fantastic job for us each, each and every day and just great role models for our, our young cadets and students. So, but I would like to also say, you know, that as a proud father of an active U.S. Marine, I really can appreciate the choices these young men and women are about to make. So again, students, I thank you for your future service. I'd like to start out with Jalen Ford. Jalen will be enlisting in the United States Air Force. Jalen was in JROTC for one semester with the rank of Cadet Sergeant. Jalen states, I'm joining the Air Force for the benefits of preparing for my future career, and I'm interested in aviation. Next, Daniel Flores. Daniel has enlisted in the United States Army. Daniel says, I joined the Army because it was always a childhood dream of mine. Congratulations, Daniel. Logan Griffin. Logan has enlisted in the United States Army. Logan was in the JROTC for four years with the rank of Cadet Gunnery Sergeant. He states, I enlisted in the Army to provide a challenge and better myself for the future. Alexander Main. Alexander has enlisted in the United States Army. Alex was in the JROTC for four years with the rank of Cadet Staff Sergeant. Alex states, it's been a lifelong dream to enlist because when they asked me what I wanted to be in elementary, I said I wanted to be in the Army. It has stuck with me as I chose to take classes like JROTC to achieve my dream. Next, Colby Benrostro has enlisted in the United States Army Reserve. Colby was in JROTC for one year with the rank of Cadet Private. Colby states, I enlisted to better my future and to make it a career. Next, Gustavo Hernandez. Gustavo has enlisted in the United States Marine Corps. Gustavo was in JROTC for four years with the rank of Cadet First Sergeant. Gustavo says, I enlisted because I want to serve my country and study law. Next, Brian Lomax. Brian has enlisted in the United States Marine Corps. Brian was in JROTC for two years with the rank of Cadet Sergeant. Brian states, I want to protect this country and do my part to make sure it stays the same for many years to come. Next, we have Cody Meade. Cody has enlisted in the United States Marine Corps. Cody was in JROTC for four years with the rank of Cadet Gunnery Sergeant. Cody states, it is a family tradition. My grandfather was in the Marine Corps for over 20 years and I wanted to follow in his footsteps. The military feels like a great place for me to start off my adult life and was an obvious and easy choice for me personally. Next, we have Travis Roach. Travis has enlisted in the United States Marine Corps. Travis was in JROTC for four years with the rank of Cadet First Sergeant. Cody states, my father served in the military and as a young child, I didn't want to serve my country and defend it. In high school, I joined the ROTC and preps for me to serve my country. Next, we have Nolan Wealthy. Nolan has enlisted in the United States Marine Corps. Nolan was in JROTC for four years with the rank of Cadet First Sergeant. Nolan has given us a quote that states, the walls of Sparta were as young men as borders and points of the spears. If your country's wall from danger is the strength of its fighting force, what's wrong with being another brick in the wall? Thank you, Nolan. Next, we have Jolyn, excuse me, Jocelyn Rueda. Jocelyn has enlisted in the United States National Guard. Jocelyn says, I chose to serve in the military because my great grandfather served in the Civil War and he has been the only person that served in the military in my family. I've always wanted to be in the military from a very young age. Next, we have Aries Salazar. Aries has enlisted in the United States National Guard. Aries says, I want to serve my country in a bigger way. Helping others and myself along the way is a gold medal. Thank you, Aries. Next, we have Giovanni De Leon. Giovanni has enlisted in the United States Navy. Giovanni was in JROTC for four years with the rank of colonel. He was a cadet commanding officer. Giovanni states, I want to make a difference in the world and follow in the footsteps of my brother, who was a U.S. Marine. Once again, we'd like to thank all our seniors who have chosen to serve in our military. Thank you. 
Bravo, bravo. I'd like to also, on behalf of Goose Creek, thank the leadership at each one of these campuses. Your principalship has served as a support for the strong leadership that we have for each of the teachers. I'd also like to thank uh, the leadership of each campus, obviously the officers in charge of our junior ROTC programs uh, uh, do the work day in and day out with these young men and women, but it's with the vision of the campus leadership. We want to appreciate each principal and your administrative teams for showing the support that you do for these programs. With that, we'll turn it back over to you, President Laredo. Thank you so much, Dr. O'Brien. Um, Thank you guys for, for all of the young ladies and young men that are signing up and serving our country. And thank you parents for, for guiding those wonderful kids as well as the uh, ROTC instructors and other teachers that have been influential in, in their lives. I appreciate that greatly. And on, on behalf of Goose Creek, we thank you for that. Um, next we have says participation, but we don't have anybody today. Uh, next we have approval of minutes. Click back on. And we have minutes for May 4th, 2020, and everybody was here. I'll move for approval of minutes as presented. A second. I have a uh, motion by Ms. Woods, second by Mr. Cotter. Any discussion? Okay, all in favor, please raise your right hand or say aye. Aye. Motion passes 740 against. Next, we have discussion item, Dr. O'Brien. Uh, this evening for our superintendent's report, we have the 2020, uh, 2021 budget workshop presented by Margie Grimes. Good evening. Let me get my content here. Can I just start? Okay, can you see the, okay, thank you. Um, good evening, Board President uh, Laredo, um, Board Members, Superintendent O'Brien and guests. Um, this is our first of two budget workshops to review and discuss the development of the 2021 budget. Um, before we look over the budget calendar, uh, I wanted to, have um, a moment just to discuss some opening comments. Um, we're sort of in some unchartered territory. Um, there's many uncertainties regarding the fiscal impact resulting from COVID-19 and Texas school districts are likely to experience disruptions in the 2021 instructional year due to the pandemic. So according to guidelines um, released by TEA, uh, we we have, we have sound finances and we're resilient uh, to handle any economic impact or any revenue shortfalls. Um, but this is unprecedented. No one knows when the event will end. Uh, no one was, knows what the ultimate impact will be. And therefore, the 21 budget uh, presentation is based on a fiscal, a typical forecast and normal assumptions. In addition, information and factors, as, as additional information and factors become known uh, that influence the budget, we're prepared to make budget adjustments accordingly. And the district does have a strong financial position, as I mentioned, and this will help offset any revenue declines. Uh, we also want to point out that although Comptroller Hager had forecasted an eight, approximately 8% 8 or $9 billion funding that was to be available for the next two year budget cycle, we believe cautious optimism uh, for continued growth is apparent due to the downward trends related uh, to COVID-19, such as the dropping oil prices, volatility in the financial markets, the lowering of interest rates, uncertainty in trade prospects, the Texas unemployment rates that could more than double, 
and estimated declines in the economic stabilization fund that have been project, projected already. Um, there is the possibility of some additional funding for Texas schools with approximately 1.3 billion from the CARES Act, roughly about 1.2 billion uh, going to local district, districts in proportion uh, to what they receive under Title I, Part A. So um, details are not yet available on exactly when the funding will occur and exactly how the money can be spent. Um, we expect more information soon. As I understand it, TEA is um, going to release an application by the end of this month. Also note on April 24th, uh, Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick announced that he's established six Senate committees or working groups to discuss the challenges that the state will face in the next legislative session due to the pandemic. So um, with that as a backdrop, um, we're prepared to adjust as we go, as new information becomes available, and we're going to proceed as, as as normal. We could create a lot of scenarios, and and uh, no one knows which one would be the right one at this point. So um, this is a uh, look at the budget calendar. Uh, we will hold our second budget workshop on June the 1st, and uh, we're scheduled to publish our notice of public hearing to discuss the budget and proposed tax rate on June the 3rd and adopt the budget on June the 15th. Um, budget objectives, I'm not going to cover this list. These are just the district standard. You may read through these yourself. They're the same as we, we adopt each year. Planning assumptions. Um, we've estimated student enrollment growth at 1%. Our preliminary taxable values for 2020 of 12.1 billion for the MO is after the value limitations, and it's slightly higher, about 1% than last year. The INS preliminary values of 15.4 billion actually decreased by about the same percent. They were down about 1%, and that all showed up in the industrial category. Um, state and local funding estimates are slightly higher just because we've included a growth rate of 1%. Uh, for Chapter 313, our revenue protection payments are not included in the general fund budget proposal. Um, we have received payments. We've continued to receive some of those payments over the past few years, and that's resulted in some excess fund balance. But at this point, not knowing, we don't have anything included in the, in the budget. Um, supplemental payments, however, from our agreements are estimated at $9 million, and they're included in the capital improvement fund. Um, as a reminder, those funds are not received until the property tax due date of January 31st, and so uh, additional projects will not commence until those funds are collected. Um, as far as the foreign trade zone revenues, those are also accounted for in the capital improvement fund. We do have preliminary values from Exxon on their uh, foreign trade zone uh, inventory. It's a little bit lower than last year, and last year we received just under 1.6. So we, we're going to be close on that. We might have a little slight, uh, slightly lower um, collection on that. Um, I'm not going to go into compensation and benefits because Dr. Wyatt will cover that a little bit later. I do want to say that we don't have a general pay increase included in the budget, and what he's going to present is also um, conditional and there's no monies at this point appropriated for, for anything in the budget for salaries. Uh, the debt service fund proposal is based on an estimated tax rate increase. Um, the increase is, is 3.9%. It's up from last year's 28 and a half cents to about 32 and a half cents for next year. Mm -hmm. This is mainly to provide for the new bonded indebtedness, the new monies that we will sell in 2020 and those related payments. And those um, bond orders will be brought to the board at the next meeting, uh, June, June 1st, uh, for your approval. Um, the food service fund um, is, is, uh, will be presented later also by Renee, and we basically want to point out that we have $1.7 committed for capital improvements. a little bit about um, our process for any unspent departmental and campus budget allotments. Uh, last year's budget proposal included a process to allow a carryover of 75% of any 1920 unspent funds to the next year, to 2021. 
We're proposing to change the process a little bit, uh, basically due to any unanticipated revenue shortfalls uh, that may result. Uh, the new cross we're recommending, it would basically work exactly the same with the exception is we will include campuses and then reduce the carryover from the 75% to 50%. A lot of the campuses and, and has have had to defer spending just because of the lack of someone at the warehouse to receive uh, every day like we, we were. So it gives them an opportunity to utilize some of their funds as well. So we thought that would be, be good for the campuses. Um, there's a couple of slides here um, on House Bill 3. Um, basically, um, we wanted to provide this information to you. Um, this, these recap major changes that basically was passed a year ago, we incorporated it into our budget in the late fall of 2019. Um, the session was basically dominated by school finance, property tax reform, and it focused on um, outcomes-based funding, new funding and reallocations, property tax relief, outdated funding mechanisms, increasing the state share of public education costs and equitable funding for students. Uh, I just wanted a summary here for you to glance at just for a quick reference uh, because this provides many of the changes that we've incorporated into the 2021 budget proposal. You can review in detail at your convenience. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the property tax rate. Um, so uh, based on House Bill 3, the district's tier one MO compressed rate will be the lesser of the state's compression percentage or the local compression percentage. This does not mean that we will, it will affect our entitlement. It just affects the rate. And again, it's just a balancing between local and state funding there. Um, this is kind of a further explanation of that. Uh, the new compressed rate for tier one of the tax rate is 91.64%. If you'll recall back before this House Bill 3 was passed, um, that part of the rate was set at a dollar. So you can kind of compare, we went down 90 to 93 cents that on the tier one, and then now we're going down to 91 uh, cents there. So why this is based on estimated statewide property value growth of 4%. And since our value growth is not estimated to exceed the statewide property average, we shouldn't have a further compression or lowering of the tax rate. Uh, we will publish, uh, you recall I said 1%, our, our m &O, uh, rates went up 1% and that falls below the 4%. So we will use the states. Uh, and it, just as a reminder, there's an inverse relationship. As values go up, your rate is further compressed. That's why if your rate is higher than the 4%, it will further compress your rate. However, we're not anticipating that based on our preliminary growth rate uh, provided of, uh, on our certified values of 1%. So this is a look at um, the actual tax rate, the estimate. Um, the MO tax rate is estimated at a dollar and a um, dollar five cents, about five and a half cents. It's gone down about 1.4 cents. And the INS rate, as mentioned earlier, is it going to be 32 and a half cents? It's up to three and a half, three point nine cents from the prior year, uh, making our total 2021 tax rate a dollar almost and 38 cents. Uh, the net increase about two and a half cents. Uh, again, this is just a, a graph of our enrollment growth. Uh, it reflects the 1% uh, enrollment growth from 23,747 to 23,984. Um, as we mentioned earlier, um, this is just to give you a, a graphic of that. Um, Certified preliminary values, this is as we discussed, this is just to give you a look five years back and you can see back in 2014 before we had any Chapter 313 agreements where the, the, the MNO and the INS values were the same and how the, the blue line, the upper line represents the growth and values that we've actually had, which the INS uses to base their tax rate on. And then the red line, the lower line is the MNO property value uh, estimate. And that is what we've used to base uh, our MNO rates on. At this point, I will turn it over to Dr. Wyatt, who will discuss our employee compensation plan for 2021. Thank you, Margie. 
Um, as uh, Margie said earlier, we are not currently, uh, there's no money in the budget right now for a uh, general pay increase. Um, we did look at several options that are listed on here. You see, we, uh, we did talk about doing no salary increase, um, doing a general pay increase just at a cost of living adjustment amount, uh, one to one and a half percent is I believe what the, the cost of living has been in the, the increase of cost of living in the, last, in the area for the last few years. Um, we were also looking at a, a one-time lump sum compensation payment that would be paid to installments um, in December and in uh, May of next year. Um, and that is the uh, recommended option at this time. Um, our uh, benefits uh, department is also looking at some other health insurance options that could uh, try to uh, decrease costs for our employees, which would be a roundabout way of increasing their take-home pay. Um, some of the uh, one of the things with the one time payment is that would be, it would be uh, conditional. Um, it would be, uh, that the money was there that the district did have the revenue to sufficiently pay for this amount of money. Um, and then it would also be uh, without creating a financial hardship for the district. Sorry. Um, we would also it gives the district some flexibility because we would be able to adjust that amount next year if there was a surprise either in a good or a bad way when it comes to the budget. And then Margie. Okay. Thank you, Ron. Um, okay, I'm gonna cover uh, just quick quickly the debt service fund uh, budget proposal, and then I'm gonna turn it over to Renee. She will cover the school nutrition fund and the long range capital improvement plan. Um, Debt service projected revenue is 50 million. You can see on the total revenue lines, I'm kind of trying to outline that box so you can see that the revenues are 50 million, 012, that number. Um, we, it's up about uh, 1.4 million from last year. Um, this increase is entirely related to the incremental tax revenue collections generated from the tax rate increase we just discussed for the new bonded indebtedness payments that we will incur once we sell the 2020 uh, bonds. Um, we're slated to sell those in around August, the time frame. Um, total expenditures increased by about three and a half million from the prior year, also due to the debt payments for the 2020 bonds. Note that the revenue increase is less than the expenditure increase, and there's a variance between our fiscal year dates and the bond payment schedule. We always have some payments that show up in you know, after the year closes in August and October. So there's always a, a variance there between those. Um, but we use the unrestricted fund balance to try to stabilize our target level. Um, so um, uh, the projected fund balance of 34.7 million includes restricted amounts of 19 and a half. It's those last two lines, the 12.8 and 6.7 added together. It's restricted both for our October 15th and October, August 15th and October 1st bond payments. And then the QSAP interest sinking fund that we have to set aside. Um, that's the 2005 uh, bonds. And then we have unrestricted funds of 15.1 million uh, that's available for debt service. And we also, like I say, we utilize that fund, that unrestricted fund to try to keep our tax rate you know, level as we move forward. We have a little room for variances there. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Renee, and she's going to talk to you about the food service fund and the long range capital improvement plan. Good afternoon. Do you have any projections and expenditures estimates of 15.4 million and 14.5 million are based on the last year's program utilization. The fiscal year 21 budget proposal includes a 1.7 million fund balance commitment for the TCCISD Education Service Center kitchen and catering project. Uh, this leaves 1.9 million or 1.5 months or 13% of reserved for food, uh, food service operations. We will monitor throughout the year on all activities and make program adjustments during the year as needed, as Margie mentioned earlier. Here we have the long range capital improvement plan. Just a reminder that the district initiated the long range capital improvement plan last year. 
pursuant to a prior board action, our three thir chapter 313 revenue and FQZ payments are accounted for in this capital improvement fund. Also recall that the plan, that this plan and budget is not required to legally be adopted by the board of trustees. Our plan is presented to provide complete information and full transparency for both the board and community. The long-term capital improvement plan is developed to account for projects that may span multiple years, multiple fiscal years. Therefore, all the transactions that may coincide with the current budget year may not coincide with the current budget year. The sources of revenue generated for each year of the five-year plan is reflected at the top of the schedule, followed by the proposed budget scheduled by, it, by year of implementation. The project implementation will not begin until revenues are calculated and received, which is typically around the due date of January 31st for the Chapter 313 revenues and FTZ revenues. Um, the schedule goes on to two, three pages. <laughs> so, um, have any questions? Our presentation and we'll answer any of your questions. have to look at a little bit longer to see if I got any questions maybe the next meeting all right thank you Howard uh, I did want to make mention that uh, good presentation by Margie and her team but uh, just as an outsider listening and you may think it's a very bleak future uh, and that's because of the unknowns the uncertainty of the pandemic but there's a lot of silver lining and the fact that the cares act was passed and uh, uh, we believe we'll get uh, help with FEMA and, and uh, for reimbursables and things of that nature. But, but more than that, I wanted to commend uh, them for the work that's been done over the last uh, three or four years, even longer, to secure the district's future with a solid um, foundation by having a fund balance that is um, that protects us for uh, far into the future. Uh, with the support of the board, uh, we have been able to um, create a very secure future for the school district financially. And um, so presentation, generally speaking, because of the uncertainty, sounds a little bleak, but I'm quite confident that we're, uh, we're on solid ground moving forward, even with the unknowns. Thank you, Mr. Loria. Um, Dean, I, I do have one question. I'm sorry. Uh, Ms. Grimes, do we have any um, idea of what the compensation is going to be for the employees? Or are we still waiting for that information? Dr. Wyatt covered that just a little bit. There was three or four proposals, and right now they're looking at rather than a continual perpetual increase at this point, they're looking at a flat rate that would be available to the employees in two two installments. Right. You want to flip? Can you flip back to that page? Sure. Do Do we have an idea of what that's going to be, or? Well, we we set a maximum. Uh, Dr. Wyatt. I can't listen. Hear you, Miss Frank. Closer to the mic. Right there. Um, up to a thousand dollars. Um, that that could be changed. But when we did this a few years back, we paid seven fifty, I think, to exempt staff, and I think it was three fifty to non-exempt. So uh, we thought we probably wouldn't exceed a thousand, um, but that could be determined at the time known resources are available. And we, that the board and the, and the um, superintendent then would have the authority to make that decision uh, once we get further into the year and once we uh, better know what our resources will be. Okay. And Martin, Thank you, can we I... have, do we have one more workshop or two more before we? One more workshop and then the adoption. Okay, then I'd like to request that we at least see a 1%, 2% raise and know what the figures are before we decide we're not doing that at all. Um, we can provide some estimates uh, as a rule of thumb. As a rule of thumb right now, 1% uh, is costing about $2 million. That's just a thumbnail. So we, you know, we, we wanted to present a balanced budget. I think the board certainly can make that decision to use existing and available fund balance since we have an excess anticipated for the current year, but we wanted to present 
what we knew would balance the budget. And then if you want to make a, an exception to that, that it be your decision. So what's the estimated cost on the one time lump sum? It depends on the amount. Well, well I know, but the scenario that's in the note down here, what would that cost? If you paid everybody I sorry, I can't hear you. I'm sorry, if you paid everybody a thousand dollars all employees a thousand dollars is about three thousand employees, so that's about okay. three million. And then okay, you thanks. have benefits on top of that, but typically right. we split it up, you know, not pay the same for exempt and non exempt, but that again is entirely up to the board's discretion. I don't I'd like to see some numbers with all of that. With a maybe one percent, two percent like we've done in the past and versus this lump sum compensation. No problem. We'll provide that along with the general fund presentation at the next meeting. Thank you. Are we talking about one percent, one and a half percent? That's the cost of living adjustment, Mr. Sampson. Okay. We'll have options for the board to consider. And the only one I've seen, uh, we were looking earlier, I think Tom Ball was, had a presenting a 2% general pay increase. Most districts after last year having a higher uh, pay increase are, are doing something like this, something that is, doesn't, is not sustainable going forward. You don't have to, it's just a one time or are offering maybe like one or 2%. That's what we've seen so far. And or waiting to hear back um, certain rulings on um, some of the legislation, so. We'll be happy to provide those scenarios. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate you guys. Um, nobody else questions. We're going to move on. Um, thank you, Ms. Grimes, to you and your team for providing that. Okay, thanks. We appreciate, we appreciate the opportunity. Got to get out of here. Next, we have a consideration of consent agenda, Dr. O'Brien. All right, for uh, 6A, consideration of consent, we have number one, discontinue premium pay for non contract and non exempt Goose Creek CSD employees. Number two, donation from GCCSD Education Foundation from T Mobile. Number three, shared services agreement between Goose Creek CSD and the Tri County Regional Day Program for the Deaf. Number four, agreement between Goose Creek CSD and Adrian Ware, LSSP. Number five, contracts with Harris County Department of Education for educational services. A, High Point School East. B, Fortis Academy Recovery High School. C, Juvenile Justice Education Program, JJAEP. Number six, final extension of CSP for technology equipment supplies and services. Number seven, second option to extend RFP for annual fire extinguisher and kitchen system inspection and related services. And number eight, second extension of CSP for janitorial and maintenance services for GCCISD administration building. Number nine, final extension of CSP for solid waste management services. Number 10, award RFP for disposal of surplus technology equipment. Administration would recommend approval of the consent agenda. However, we do have staff online uh, available to answer any questions that you may have at this time. Anybody like to um, say anything from consent agenda? What was the earlier name for some gentleman, but I didn't get the name. We said on it. 5B is Fortis Academy. Is that what you're asking about? Maybe that was, I thought it was another was single name. It's, uh, that is the Harris County Department of Ed. It's, um, it was formerly a, an empty building, a vacated building. I believe it was an elementary school of HISD that Harris County was able to acquire. And with the acquisition of that building, they've converted it into a, an academy, if you will, for students with uh, um, addiction concerns. And so uh, what they do is they serve all of the greater Houston area and Goose Creek has uh, joined in with that and uh, providing services to students and families that may have needs within the Goose Creek boundaries. It's a contract with uh, Harris County Department of Ed for Fortis Academy. Okay. I have two questions. I have two questions. Uh, number one just coincides with the end of instruction. So we don't do the premium pay anymore. Is that right? Correct. Some, okay. school, some school districts, we're ending it at the end of this month. Uh, right. Some school districts ended it April 14th, the first day it was eligible to be ended. Okay. We've sustained it. And then the donation from the Education Foundation, is that 
earmarked to pay T-Mobile? No, sir. It's from uh, T-Mobile. It's, uh, it's a guided donation from okay. T-Mobile. And it went to it, um, uh, a portion of it. Uh, Matt Flood was able to utilize for iPads that were distributed during okay, the so pandemic. We're, we're just passing that through the foundation. That's correct. Okay, thank I, I let the little check confuse me a little bit. Well, I'm glad you asked though, because it, it, yeah, that's it has a very served, generous donation. It is, and it serves two purposes. One, to replace uh, iPads, but the other one's a really cool one that you got to see a little snippet of is the um, flash drives that will be handed to every single senior as a part of their graduation package. They'll get a video nice. of the virtual graduation along with video clips of their campus and activities that are going on. So we're very thankful to T-Mobile. Absolutely. Thank you. Dr. Bryan, in, in, um, did the Education Foundation apply for that grant? Is that why it went through the Education Foundation? No, sir. They looked, um, they called and said, we would like to contribute towards any child that might be suffering uh, within our Goose Creek boundaries. And we just were seeking for a target, a, a way, a, a, a purpose to donate funds to. And this is one of the things Ms. Foster is the director of the Education Foundation. And um, I simply made a call to her and found out whether or not um, those funds would be accessible to go through into a technology component for uh, the students that, that we've supported through the um, uh, stay at home order. And uh, she said, absolutely. She got, of course, the uh, board members from the Education Foundation endorsed the idea. And so it is a flow through. And it's one of their purposes is to seek out opportunities to flow through money to support. Uh, uh, we're, they're known for the teachers, uh, grants, but they 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 also support our students in any way they possibly can. So uh, T-Mobile was just looking for a target and we were graciously uh, accepting of that that donation. Okay, thank you. Okay, so anybody you'd like to pull anything from the agent, consent agenda? Can I, get an approval? I would move that we, I'm sorry, I would approve, uh, make a motion that we approve consent agenda item 6A1 through 10 as presented. I second. I have a motion by Mr. Clem, second by Mr. Cotter. Hi there, though. Um, there's any other discussion? <laughs> All in favor, please raise your right hand or say aye. Aye. Motion passes them 4 0 against. Uh, next, we have future board agenda items, board training, and board meetings. Does anybody have anything they'd like to see on the agenda? Ms. Garcia got news today, and she may have already communicated to you that the scheduled workshop this summer for Summer Leadership Institute has gone virtual rather than in purpose. I was going to say during trainings. I'll sorry, sorry, okay. sorry. No future board agenda items, trainings. I think Mr. O'Brien, Dr. O'Brien mentioned that. Anything about the next board meeting is on June the 1st. Uh, a board shuffle there. Um, <coughs> we're going into closed session. The next board we meet the June first, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, the board will now recess into a closed session pursuant to the following sections of Texas Open Meetings Act: Texas Government Code Section five five one zero seven one zero seven two zero seven three zero seven four zero seven five zero seven six zero eight two zero eight three. 084 and 087. No action will be taken while the board is in closed meeting at 6.51 p.m. Uh, time is now 6, 7.39. Board will, re will come back into open session. No meeting was, no decision was made while we were in closed session. Uh, Dr. O'Brien. Yes. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. All right. Administration recommends approval of the elections as presented, accepting the resignations and retirements as presented. I move to approve. We have a motion by Mr. Clem, second by Mr. Cotter. Any dis any um, any discussion? All in favor, please raise your right hand or say aye. Mr. Sampson not on here? He's on mute, I think. Oh, Mr. Sampson, can I get a thumb up or? I'm abstaining. Okay. Motion passes 640 against one abstention. 
And next we have notification of elections uh, as approved by the superintendent during the pandemic, uh, noted on page 105 through page 109. And then our next recommendation will be consideration of administrative personnel. We recommend the election of Justin Schutz as a licensed specialist in school psychology. I'll move to approve the election. Second. Uh, motion by Ms. Guy, seconded by Mr. Clem. Any discussion? All in favor, please raise your right hand or say aye. Aye. Motion passes seven four zero against. Administration recommends the approval of the elections as presented this evening. I'm sorry, we've already completed that. Let me move to the administrative personnel. Uh, election of Kay Simon as a speech language pathologist. Dr. O'Brien, point, point of order. Thank you. Um, I thought I was skipping a page here. Uh, Dr. O'Brien. Let me get back on order. The elections of a diagnosticians. We have three diagnosticians, Susan Parmley, Margaret Moody, and Monica Armendariz. Are we back on line, Mr. Chapa? Yes, sir, we are. Thank you. 4B is what you just said. The diagnosticians. Yes, sir. Okay, I move to approve. I second. I have a motion by Mr. Clem, second by Ms. Woods. Any discussion? All in favor, please raise your right hand or say aye. Against abstentions. Abstentions. And we have a recommendation for. Speech language pathologist Kay Simon. I'll move to approve. Order, that, person, that person has withdrawn her name from consideration. Thank you, Mr. Chapa. Withdrawn that recommendation by administration. And we have finally recommendation for principal of Crockett Elementary, Talise Anawan. Second. Motion by Ms. Woods, who's, was that Mr. Clem? Mm -hmm. Any um, discussion? A motion by Ms. Woods, second Mr. Clem. All in favor, please raise your right hand or say aye. Against? Abstentions. Abstention. Six, four, zero against, one abstention. Did I miss the psychology? We got the... We pulled that. That's right. Speech language pathologist was. Well, we did do 4A. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Okay, good. I, I, okay. Well, having concluded the agenda for the May 18th school board meeting, I close this meeting at 7.44 p.m. You'll have a blessed day.